So welcome to episode eight of the Oso oh Spurs podcast, where we're going to try remain positive in a pretty miserable period that we find ourselves in. And uh, one way to do that is we've got a guest of us today from the Dr. Tottenham podcast in Vass. Hi, thanks for having me on, Phyllis. Thanks for coming on. And then from the usual crowd, we've got Sai with us today. Hello, Jim. You all right? Yeah, good. Thanks, mate. And, and then lastly, we've got Johnny with us as well. Yeah, good to see you guys. So where else do we start, guys, than the <laughs> <laughs> than Milan that over the weekends? Where's everyone's head at at the moment? Um, we'll, we'll start with through our guest in the deep end, Vass. What, what, what did you make of it? How are you feeling? <clears throat> I, I, I'm not feeling great, to be honest. Uh, I started the season a little bit concerned about our dull performances and fearing that other teams had figure this out and I was like okay we're going to see the real Spurs after the World Cup we're preserving our energy <laughs> for then uh, and it hasn't got any better since and last night was just it was just awful really really was awful I was watching the Chelsea game the night before and they were at a 1-0 deficit didn't they from um, Dortmund and they started their game you know on fire going for it, got the crowd up, everything else. And I thought, well, that's obviously what Spurs have got to do, right? Oh, wrong. Um, I, I don't know. It was shocking, Jim. It was really bad. I, I'm firmly in the sort of Conte out camp now. I've, I've had enough. I've got to be honest. Yeah. And what about you, Johnny? Yeah. I mean, I don't think too many people are going to disagree with that. Um, a, a lot of people talking about the atmosphere. We've, we've spoken about the atmosphere ourselves over the last few weeks and uh, the criticism has been sometimes a bit unfair but uh, the noise inside the stadium at the beginning last night was it was right up there it was mm. absolutely rocking um the the whole light show and everything like it was very you know I, I had a mate with me that doesn't usually go to the games and you know he's there taking videos of everything it was like a proper you know razzmatazz thing but like you know the fans were matching that and there's a lot more of the flags like uh, in the south stand um all the way back up pretty high up the back of the south stand uh felt like okay now <laughs> the fans are doing everything that they need to do um but like <laughs> 15 minutes in like it, it went back to the right to sort of the the, the general you know like they're, the the players obviously didn't just didn't keep it going they did they didn't um they didn't give the start that we were looking for and a lot of talk today about about what we saw i guess so many individual performances that were really disappointing you you look at like the Romero is obviously a very you know it, it's it's something to consider questioning his temperament and his maturity and letting letting the side down on on, on the big occasion but there's so much more was wrong than than just that I mean for me I I was surprised that people weren't a bit more complimentary but Ollie Skip I thought that Skip had a really good game and I was really impressed by him um, and Parra, obviously, when he came on, did a good job. Forster did, did what he needed to do. Actually, made a couple of good saves. Got a bit lucky there with that one off the post at the end. But, I mean, it was just a really shocking, really shocking performance. And you, you know, you you go to a lot of trouble to get these games. It, it was a a bit of a magical mystery tour for me to to teach in Dublin until one o'clock and then get to the kickoff by before eight o'clock, and then you just get served that absolute crap. Mm -hmm. um, you know. Staying in our hotel airport overnight and back in an early plane to get back to teach again in the morning. That's what that, that I'm, I'm nothing special, but like fans make such an effort to go to see these lads that are getting paid six figure sums every week. And um, yeah, I'm Conti out for sure as well. I mean, the substitutions, all of all of these things, you know, it, it just confirms what we kind of probably thought before, but. Um, it's just it's it's not just it's not just the manager like the players really like you get you get yourselves in the Champions League they think of the journey the effort the the conversations we have every year about can we finish in the top four and it's still their conversation we're having now and then like that you get to the knockout rounds and and that's the way you perform it's, it just beggars belief really you know um, so yes yeah, certainly had better better nights um, at Tottenham than that it was really disappointing I thought we'd. I thought we'd go through. I was quite confident because we usually follow a couple of poor games 
when it comes down to it, isn't like we, we perform against City when we perform against Chelsea. I know it's Chelsea, we're rubbish, but you know we did the job against City like we always seem to do. Normally, it's Tottenham bring bring their best performances on the big occasion against the stronger teams, but it just didn't happen last night. Mm. So, yeah, very really bad. <clears throat> and go on, Si, what's your take on it? Well, I was scrabbling around trying to find a, a, a feed for it because my Sky, I couldn't get my Sky working out here in the hotel and I managed to get one. I was, I was on a four-minute delay, so I hid my phone so it wasn't getting the notifications and all that sort of mm-hmm. stuff. And I was like, uh, every so often I was wanting to check the phone just in case I was missing something <laughs> because I didn't know, I couldn't quite get my head around what, what was going on. It was, um, you know, if you're Milan... You'll come into the game and you're thinking, right, let's quieten this crowd down. But we did it ourselves. They didn't have to do yeah. anything. They just knocked the ball about and we let them do it. And it's like, during that first half, I'm thinking at some point we're going to go and put some pressure on these boys. Because I know Stu's been sort of tweeting and, uh, and, and in the WhatsApp and on the, last, uh, on the last pod that this Milan side is a stronger Milan side than we played out there, right? Absolutely get it. They've got some people back. The keeper is a much more dominating keeper in the box, etc., etc. But they're still not great. They're still not a good side. We're still, if you look player for player, we're, we, we can match them. They couldn't afford to go and buy Porro. They couldn't afford to mm. go and get Dan Juma. They couldn't afford to go and get Richarlison. But they were just so comfortable last night. And uh, Liao looked good in the second half, even though when we put on a little bit more pressure, he was there out and he was so strong. He was so strong, and he, he he did he did such a good job. I agreed at Porro when he came on, and he's got something there for the future, without a doubt. Did a good job. Skip did a good job in the middle, but the rest of them, my God, I just it was just a whimper, wasn't it? Just it was like you know those really crappy indoor fireworks that you used to get as a kid, where you're expecting so much, and then you let them off, and this little snake curls out. And it's like, oh, <laughs> It felt like that, didn't it? It's a good analogy of it. It really felt like we were the team defending a 1 0 lead from the start. Yeah. It's kind of how I felt. Yeah. And and the the boys are right. I mean, the the atmosphere at the start was was quite loud. The the, the crowd were up for it. Conte um, requested that the fans get behind the team and, and, and be the driving force. And I think they went there with that intention, all the fans. But. It's almost like they sent us to sleep after about 15 minutes. It just went deathly yeah. quiet. Um, and there was nothing happening to sort of trigger the crowd into any form of life. Mm. Uh, and that first half was just a whole wasted 45 minutes. But how many of those have we had this season? It's just terrible. Yeah, yeah, it really yeah. was. And it wouldn't have taken much to keep that crowd <clears throat> going from that first five or ten minutes, right? Yeah. A couple of decent tackles, a good early chance, yeah. you know. Yeah. And it wouldn't have taken much to get the crowd keeping that, that, that atmosphere, keeping that going. And it's just like, like you said, Vaz, it's, it's like, here we go again. And we've yeah. seen it all before. And it's this half again. And, oh, my God, it doesn't matter what we do. It's just going to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Does does it feel to you like that game was a sign he's lost the dressing room, as it were? Is Romero's red card just a timing thing that's just inevitable, <laughs> or does this all feel a bit too deliberate? The, the, the Romero red card was reckless, stupid, yeah, um, unnecessary, and just killed what little momentum we managed to garner in that second half. To be honest. Um, and as much as I love Romero, you've you got to wonder about his mindset. I, I, it just gives me the impression that ever since he won the World Cup, he doesn't give a toss anymore about what happens the rest of the season, um, which is a shame. Uh, you know, we, we're going to be with, well, mind you, it's only a Champions League suspension he gets now, isn't it? So uh, he's fortunate in that regard because we might not be in it next season. Um, it, yeah, I mean, I think Richarlison's comments after the game sort of give you a clear idea as to, how everything's looking in and around the club at the moment. Um, he'll probably get fined. But, you know, I've made excuses on our pod for for Conte in as far as he's had a lot going on in his life. He's lost three close friends. He's had um, missing his family, etc. health issues, blah, blah, which you get. But at the same time, he's just been given the impression that he doesn't really want to be there. And he's been given that impression for mm. a little while. And if you like that, you know, in any job, if, if, if you're the boss and you're going in and you're looking like you're not going to be there, why are your 
employees and colleagues going to do more than you're doing it essentially and it's it's not looking good and i think the time has come really the, the obvious it, the obvious factor is the selections you know the substitutions because it mm. looked until until the obvious um er, decision to put on well <laughs> the far from obvious decision to put on um sanchez and take off kulsevsky uh, it kind of like we actually had so many attacking players on until then um, and you know, I was kind of thinking, oh, right, actually, he's he is kind of going for it. Although you you, you sort of wonder, well, when is Dan Juma going to get his his opportunity? And I know um, going to be coming on to Sonny or, or talking about Kulusevski later, but like like Sonny was just, just as horrendous as he's been most of the season, like all mm. game really. And um, Dan Juma still not getting anywhere near the pitch. So and and obviously Mora's kind of been getting in ahead of him, but like Mora didn't get on, on either. So you've got both of those options on the bench, and you bring on Davins and Sanchez. So I mean, mm-hmm. I I don't know what you thought, Jim, or or how it was kind of commented by the um, the pundits or whatever. But pe- a lot of people criticising the booing of, the, of when the Sanchez substitution took place. For me, I thought it was a response to Conte rather than to Sanchez because I know Sanchez isn't the most popular player. But it was just such a horrendous decision that which made absolutely no sense. That to me, it felt like it was directed at Conte, and like I, that's how I perceived. It. That's how, what, what I was angry with, and anyone I could hear around me was just like just completely perplexed at that mm. at that decision. Um, so it's like, yeah, I think I think most fans have now reached that stage, and last night underlined it again with, with just the, the yeah, the, just. <laughs> His decision making is so so yeah. bloody bizarre. You, it's you like know going what? back to the, the Wolves game and the not making substitutions in the Wolves game until the, uh, we we lose the goal, and you know it's like not making changes earlier on. It's just, this is the this is the thing about watching crap football. It's it's bad enough, but this is a guy who's won titles and he doesn't seem to have a response. Doesn't seem to have a, a, a plan B, and then when you've got fifteen minutes off the most important game. Where your only opportunity, however slim that might be, of winning silverware, is is there. You've still got fifteen minutes. You bring on Davinson Sanchez. Like uh, that <laughs> kind of really is the last nail in the coffin. Would, wouldn't it just? Wouldn't it just? And listen, as all you boys know, I'm no tactical genius. We've got other people on the pod for that tactical <laughs> mouse, right? Um, yeah. And I'm sitting there with the missus yesterday, and she just turned to me and went, "Is Sanchez a defender?" And I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, yeah, yeah." And she said, Kulu's an attacker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and we have to score a goal. Uh (laughs) She just looked at me and said, what's he doing? She's been to two Spurs games in her life. (laughs) Well, there you go. That says it all, doesn't it? I mean, in fairness, I think just before that happened with the Romero sending off, I saw Dan Juma warming up quite rigorously. I thought, he was going to come on. And for all that Johnny said about Conte's substitutions this, this year, which have been horrific, um, he, he pulled Perisic off quite early, didn't he, and made that switch and put Poro on. So that, that was good. And yeah. then um, it seemed as though we were going to um, bring Dan Juma on. And then the Romero thing happened and his natural instinct kicked in. You think, oh, sugar, mm. I'm a defender down, I'd better put another defender on it. It's just ridiculous, really. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it's... Uh, it, it, you know, you said also about a plan B, Johnny, sorry. Uh, he's, mm. A plan B from Conte would be tantamount to admitting failure, I think, because mm. if, if he's got to adopt yeah. a plan B, it means his plan A isn't working, and he's so <sighs> wedded to that plan A that this is this is what we get. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what Luca was saying last week, right? Luca was saying that the Milan support that we had on last week, he was saying that, you know, in Italy, they are well aware it's all about Conte as well. Conte is all about Conte. He's not about the broader picture. He's not about anybody else. It's all about him. It's all about his decisions. It's all about what he looks like, his perception. And it just shows when, when, when you see that sort of thing from last night and, you know, how involved he was in, in, the, in the Sheffield stuff and... And the Wolves stuff as well was, you know, goes to show as well. I mean, you know, three games and we look like Sheffield, we're prioritising 
these two wolves and this. And where's the priority then? What priority was there last night? There was no mm. priority there last night. Yeah, it's the same. Unless the same Milan fan, as the Milan fan was telling us, he's. It's not just that. It's the way he finds a way of polarizing your entire fan base. Like even mm. beyond just him, I've found our fan base has become more fractious oh, than ever. It's become more. <laughs> you're either in or you're out with that chairman or for a certain player or for the manager and everyone is just at each other's throats and Mm. it's all linked to this turgid depressing style of football that is so hard to get behind Mm. and he's never left a club with a reputation intact has he yeah no all his old employers hate the guy <laughs> I was talking to a good Chelsea pal today actually who was, was, was chatting away on, on, on WhatsApp and he said this is just the, the way it ended at Chelsea mm. with him it's exactly yeah. the same he blames the board he blames not so he blames the attitude he blames the commitment he blames everything but himself it's what Mourinho does as well right? Mourinho yeah, exactly. does that as well Mourinho blames everyone yeah. but himself when everything yeah. when, when it works he's a genius when it doesn't work it's everybody else's fucking fault yeah. It's just, Too much it's ego, that, isn't it? That, it's, I think, is the real thing that gets us right. Is like There's no accountability from the man at all. Mm. Except it's 15 million quid's worth of accountability, obviously. Uh, Don't worry about that. That's fine. Pick that up and have a walk, but, you know. But last he, night he had he the was, temerity to... Sorry, Johnny. Uh, last no, night he had, the, he had the temerity to say something about, you know, do you realise, you know, who we were playing today? We were playing... the the team who were champions yeah, of exactly. Italy last season. You know, this is Milan yeah. with a big history, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So what happened yeah. last week? Sheffield United didn't yeah. really yeah, respect exactly. our history or where we were. Yes, yeah, bullshit. Yeah. Just, yeah, anyway. yeah. Sorry, we it's, can't it's invent really... a win. Is that what you said? We can't invent a win can't as well, didn't he? Uh, yeah. uh, when he's talking uh, in his press conference, it's like he also talks about Tottenham like he's – He's not a part of Tottenham. It's like yeah. he's apart from Tottenham, and he's like, you, you, you think, oh, Tottenham know how I feel. We'll sit down, sit, sit down with Tottenham yeah. at the end of the season. Like, wait a minute, you, you, you are Tottenham. Tottenham. You're, like, you're our, you're our figurehead, mate. You're like, <laughs> yeah. seriously, it, it's, it's and, 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 oh, yeah, you're, you're. But this whole thing is like, I'm a teacher, okay? So like, you don't t- tell kids you can't do something. You don't say that this class is better than your. This class is better than our class or anything like. You know, like, and even, okay, maybe he doesn't say that in in uh, private with them, but like, I'm sorry, yeah. it, it, even more to the the point that yeah. you should be bigging up your your brands and your your yeah, players exactly. publicly. And he's just like, yeah, you. I mean, we are Tottenham is like. Listen to Luca last on, on the previous podcast talking about Spurs and the name of Spurs in Italy and the reputation around the world of the club. Yeah, it, we are uh, having a drought when it comes to trophies and. and that's something that he hadn't realised was as bad as it is. Yeah. But like Tottenham is a big club, and he's talking about as like you know we're bloody crew Alexander or something. It's like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, it's really disrespectful. And yeah. we're like we're invested that it's in our blood, and and like it's such a huge part of. How dare you actually talk about our club like that? I'm sorry. It's I'm scared. Really, it's so yeah. disrespectful. It pisses me off. Yeah, so, yeah. you got people on this call like. Bash, you were saying you drive three hours to get to each game. Johnny's flying over as a season ticket holder from Dublin every week. I'm driving two hours. Sai's coming over from Switzerland. Stu's coming over from Dubai. Like, we we give so much. And in return, we just have this absolute yeah. twat with a six-figure hair transplant just <laughs> being absolute Johnny. cock. Johnny, Someone's, can you imagine... Yeah. Can you, sorry, sorry, Jim. Johnny, can you imagine, right, going into your... Headmaster, your your head of school again. Yeah. Oh, you, you just can't teach these kids, can you? Because <laughs> he's going to go. That's literally your job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we can't invent a win. Yeah. That's your job to invent yeah. the wins. Rich yeah. Allison summed it up right. He's yeah. he doesn't How take do we any feel shit. about that? Well, if they well, actually, you guys go first. No, go on, Jim. <laughs> you go. Oh, no, okay. My personal view is I want to see – there's talk now he needs to be disciplined, right? Two weeks, wages, docked forever. I want it to wake up in the morning to the news they've docked Conte's wages for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and, we're, and everyone's on Rich Allison's side. Um, but I know that would never happen. But, yeah, I, I'm so glad he said it. But it's just a sign that he's completely lost the dressing room. And yeah. what is the point in holding on to this guy another 24 yeah. hours? Yeah. It's, there's, there's a screenshots going around as well of some of the staff members who put – 
messages out on social media platforms, basically complaining about his attitude to Conte's since he's come back. And yeah. they were obviously deleted and their other spouses had to delete their profiles and all this stuff. But there's clearly a toxic outburst going on at the moment in, in the training ground. Yeah. And it's interesting because obviously like the, the narrative in the media and everything as, as always is like Harry Kane and what's going to happen in the summer. And I listened to the BT after much um, discussion about Kane and moving on like we get every year and every year you get told, well, it's now or never. Well, it was now or never last season. It was now or never the season before. And he's still what is, but now it's now or never. And, and when Conte like has, has created this really poor, atmosphere and and like why would why would Kane want to play under him like I I, I don't understand like it's, it's not the primary um, objective if you're changing a manager to keep Harry Kane although that's something I would think the vast majority of fans would like to, to happen but um, no, I, it's, I didn't, it's a I strange didn't... it's a strange one to sort of reflect on well we've got to we've got to sort of have somebody of his standing or like you know what what does it say about spurs ambition if you know we were we can't do anything with conte like well, we couldn't do anything with Mourinho either we couldn't do anything okay nuno didn't get wasn't around long enough but you know what i mean like it's it's a strange it's a strange one that uh, i i would understand if steve cooper was appointed why um harry kane wouldn't want to hang around and, and fans would get would be pissed off like most of us were probably not very impressed with the Nuno appointment, but that was a whole other charade. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, where do we go? Well, there's absolutely no point in, in hanging on to, to Conte because there's still 12 games or something left. There's still, I mean, it's you want to be in the Champions League next year for lots of reasons. Um, but if, if like, it, it we're still actually fourth, um, are we going to finish fourth if we keep him? I don't think so in a million years. Um, is it is it a possibility that a new manager comes in? I think we we all know who we'd, we'd be talking about as the, the most likely replacement. Like I, I would think that you, there's still a lot of the season to to play for, and mm. um, we we it's it's going to be really frustrating because we're not gonna we're not gonna sack him imminently unless we get turned over like really badly by Forest at the weekend. Maybe I don't know. Maybe Levy realizes he just can't ignore the, the fans any longer, but. It's, then it's coming down to money again and payoffs and all that kind of stuff. I don't know. Like it's just, I don't see the point in keeping them. Hmm. I, I don't see how money and payoffs come into it. To be perfectly no. honest, because if he's only got a last to the end of the season, if he stays, you're paying him to the end of the season. If he goes, yeah. you're paying him to the oh. end of the season. So I don't think money is the issue. I don't know what else might be the issue, mm. but certainly yeah. I thought I thought if we'd have exited. Uh, the Champions League that he'd be gone for lane day. I did not expect it yeah, to drag yeah. on mm -hmm. uh, even longer. I can't see the point of it dragging on any longer. Mm -hmm. And as far as Harry Kane goes, I've always felt that he kind of missed the biggest opportunity to leave that time when City wanted him. And after that, he was kind of stuck with us. And then when Conte <laughs> came and things started off going quite well, it, you know, I felt like Conte, this would be the thing to keep Kane and to move the club on. And actually, Conte's arrival put the, all the yearning for Poch firmly in the rearview mirror. Mm. But mm. then here we are this season. All he's done is managed to have such a, a change in, in mood at the club that we're all back talking about Pochettino again and whoever. So I think, really, whereas I couldn't see Kane leaving before, I now can. I can see him yeah. moving on in the summer. I probably mm. wouldn't blame him, to be perfectly honest with you. But, mm. Vash, you no, lead me, on to me neither. Okay. But, on, but I don't know where he goes, Fez. I don't know where he goes now. Man United's the, ob the obvious one that people are talking mm. about. But I don't think he... He's age now. I don't think he fits Ten Hag's system as well as he would have done four or five years ago. Because Ten Hag is that high-energy, high-pressing... Um, I think he goes for the... Uh, is it Usman who's uh, at Lazio at the moment. I think they're in for him in the summer. And mm. let's say he doesn't go to, to Man United. Where else does he go? Because I think he wants to stay in the Premier League. Mm. I don't think he wants to well, go abroad. Yeah, I, I suppose it would depend on the kind of investment you might see at somewhere like Newcastle. I know that doesn't guarantee mm. trophies. Um, so that yeah. would be a long shot, perhaps. Aside so, from that, I can't really... I, I don't know is the short answer. But then yeah. 
you might think you might fancy Bayern or, or PSG or somewhere like that where he's almost yeah, guaranteed. I mean, he could, go, he could go abroad, I get, yeah. But I think he mm. wants to stay and try and break this Premier League record, right? Yeah, probably. Mm. probably. Someone did say, which does, when you think about it, it, does kind of make sense. And I know they've got Nunes, but Liverpool, if it was on free transfer, they could probably match his wages and Klopp would probably be someone he, he might feel... He could win something on the... another year, though, isn't it? To a free transfer. Mm. Yeah, it, it wouldn't obviously be this. I can't see yeah. us selling. Whatever happens, I think we're going to drag yeah, it out agree. and just hope we turn things around in the meantime yeah. to the point we convince him to stay. Yeah, and, and that, I that think kind of... the, the Liverpool point, just to close that one, Jim, they wouldn't do anything with him this year because they need to invest elsewhere. Their front line's okay for another season at least. Mm. They need to bolster that midfield this year in the summer, yeah. and that's where they're going to spend big. Their, 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 their front boys are doing all right at the moment. And I think, you know, with Gakpo, with, with Jota, because he's out injured at the moment, Jota, right? So you've got Jota, Gakpo, Nunes and, and Salah. And he signed a long, long-term long deal recent this season, I think. He signed a what, five-year yeah. deal, was it? So well, I'm Jota's not sure they're even cool. thinking about up front at the moment. They've got, they've got to bolster their midfield because their midfield is going, going down the pan. Mm. Mm. I'll fill you with nightmares and just leave this horrible thought here. What if in 12 months' time Chelsea offer him 500 grand a week and say you can stay in London, keep your family here? Yeah. We'll make you the pinnacle of our club. We need a striker. I, I, I know it sounds stupid, Thanks, but I actually Jim. wouldn't. I've got I, to go, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I, actually wouldn't, I actually wouldn't completely rule that out. I know yeah. it's, it would be crazy for him to destroy his legacy, but it's not quite Arsenal. And yeah, you never know. It's not um, far off, though, is it? It's not far off, no. but it's. But and, and Vas, you started touching on this, but and, I, and I'll start with you because you did kind of talk about it a bit. How did we go from this upward trajectory at the end of last season? Everything was going so well; we were all delighted with the appointment. To a, a kind of reasonably strong summer, mm. to getting worse I, this season to such a level. It's um, it's a strange one. I, I um, I was talking to an Arsenal fan friend of mine. Yeah, there are one or two, sadly. Um, and I was saying to him that the way the season finished last season, um, and then the summer with the transfers, I actually expected Spurs to have the kind of season that we're seeing from Arsenal right now just the way the momentum was building and, and, and the progression that we were showing. But it's been <clears throat> a total drop-off. And, and he said to me that actually the best thing that happened to Arsenal was Spurs finishing in fourth. And that seems to have been the case. Um, I don't know where, where it all started turning sour. Could it be linked to <clears throat> excuse me, the passing of Ventroni when he went? Maybe everything dipped after that and he never really quite recovered. And then once he'd lost uh, Mihailovic and um, Viali soon after, it just maybe got to him. But we haven't looked ourselves all season. And I think the issue has been because opposing teams figured out how to play us. And it wasn't difficult. I mean, mm-hmm. we, were, we were scoring goals for fun last season. Some of the games that we mm-hmm. saw was excellent. But this mm-hmm. season, we, we, we struggled. We had a good second half against Leicester and a good opening day victory against uh, Southampton. And apart from that, there's not been too much else. We, um, we are predictable in our play. Teams know that all they need to do is close in on Harry Kane, stop him, stop Harry Kane, stop him dropping into midfield, uh, close down our wing backs for whatever that's worth. Um, Son hasn't been able to run in behind anybody this season because of the way we play. And we've just looked Bang average, and that's what we are right now. Hmm. Yeah, and we keep get that that uh, it comes up again and again and again. That two versus three in the midfield, we're overrunning the midfield a lot. And if you haven't got the out balls into the channels for your wing backs or for Son or Kulusevski, then you you haven't got a system because that's where your system breaks down. If you haven't got those out balls to hold deep and then hit on the break, and we've been playing Son too narrow. He's been, I think uh, I think you guys raised it on your pod fast around you know he's we're playing into his feet all the time with his back to goal that's not his game that's never been his game it will never be his game 
Mm-hmm. And we're expecting him to behave like Kane. We're expecting him to be able to receive the ball and play balls around like Kane does. Never in a million years is that his song going to be effective in that way. No. Mm-hmm. We've only got 15 minutes left, so I'll skip along to the next big topic, which is obviously where do we go next? We've been linked today alone with, top of my head, Deserby, Frank, Hotch, <laughs> Enrique, Amarim, Company, Steve Cooper... The Celtic manager, I think there's 10 to 12 names yeah. that are the media reporting are genuinely on our short list. <coughs> Postman oh. Pat, Bob the Builder, they're all <laughs> Do a better it's... job than Conte right now. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Bob, Bob would so... make it solid, without a doubt. Yeah, the foundations would. in, wouldn't he? <laughs> he in. would. Build a wall. <laughs> Pat always delivers. <laughs> Some of those yeah. managers, I know. <laughs> All the dad jokes are coming out now. Oh, yeah. no. You guys make me feel young. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers, Jim. <laughs> Where do we go but, from here? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, well, there's some... Some of the names being linked, particularly Enrique, just seem... Who's apparently top of our shortlist, don't seem to make any sense based no. on the fact we've invested 300 million into players, which wouldn't suit his style of football. But... Before I lead into a biased kind of question, where are all your heads at in terms of who you would like to see next? Where do you think we'll go next? No, for, for, for me, I think as I was saying in the WhatsApp group earlier, like it, it's Pochettino is always going to be well, most likely the, the first name that most fans or a huge number of fans are going to mention as soon as there's the Spurs are back in this position where we're not happy with the current manager. And until we've actually <laughs> gone with them for the second time, like nothing will ever change. And I think again, it's like you know the message on in the dressing room on the on that notice board whenever he left, and uh, the book with uh, Guillaume Balague, and you know all of the memories from the years he was with us before and the connection. Like it's you know, every fan, I think, really loved him. Um, yeah, there's some people that don't want him back. I, I guess we're all a bit nervous about him coming back and not working out, about selling reputations, so, so like uh, his reputation being tarnished by a return. But it seems very obvious that from what you can gather in terms of um, the reports that he's very keen to, to return and a huge number of the fans, including myself, would be more than happy because we know that his philosophy is... Um, quite different from the managers we've had since him. And that's what we've kind of been, we're just sort of sick of watching that sort of negative football and to go along and watch us like lose, but lose trying and try and tap into player strength and play a more expansive, a pacey, um, you know, champagne kind of football. Like it, that, that's would be a hell of a welcome change. So for me, um, the other names on the list, really, I, I, I guess the Brighton manager, it, it, it would be um, unrealistic, probably because he's not in the in the job very long. Um, although he does look like a really credible candidate, um, I don't really know why Enrique would be any different from the. I know he's not exactly the same kind of style of football as the ones we've just had, but it seems quite similar in, in the sense of you're you're going for another big name. It'd be like Tuchel again, like. I, I don't think that those. I, I think we need something a bit fresher than that. I, I like um, Ange Postecoglou. I, I, I've got a background growing up in Scotland. I know uh, one of my best mates is Celtic support, and the the job he's done there is actually incredible. Uh, there's a really good di- um, documentary about Postecoglou, the job he's done there, and it's it was it's not the first um, club he's got, gone to, and first job he's done an amazing job. And I think like. There's a lot of parallels with what he's done at Celtic and what Pochettino did with Tottenham first time round. The, the the bond between the players, the manager, and the fans at Celtic is incredible at the moment, and they play and they play really good football. And I know like people say SPL is Mickey Mouse. Yeah, fair enough, it is. It is a two two horse race, but I I would be happy for him to come along because I, I I believe in what he's done there. But I don't think m- most fans wouldn't entertain that because they just think that. You know, Scottish football's a bit of a joke, so mm. it's not going. It's unlikely to happen. But so for me, there's really only one sh- show in town, and I think um, the sooner we bring them back, the better. And let's just do it. 
that's yeah let's I just think, bring them back i think um we need to scratch that Pochettino itch, yeah. don't we? Mm-hmm. Because if we don't, it's gonna, it's just gonna keep, it's just gonna stay there. Uh, yeah. We need to pop that boil or whatever you need to do. I just, for me, we need a candidate who's going to aspire for the job, who mm. wants to coach up into the job. I mean, Luis Enrique, lovely guy, plays good football, but he's managed Barcelona, he's managed Spain. You know, mm. coming to Tottenham now will be a step down, whatever anybody thinks. Mm. And any mm-hmm. any new coach or manager that you get who feels that Tottenham is a step down, I don't think it's going to work. We've we've seen that with Mourinho. We've seen it with mm. Conte now. It's just not going to work. So you need someone to, to elevate themselves into the job, much like Pochettino did originally. And for me, really, I think Pochettino is the standout candidate. I know some people don't want him back because they just focus on those last 12 months. I think there are mitigating factors. I think the fact that he elevated us and grew with us so quickly ahead of time, it made the stadium build coincide and come at precisely the wrong time for us. Mm. The lack of investment at the time had a knock-on effect subsequently. It affected Pochettino's mood, and it all kind of crumbled. So mm. I feel there are mitigating factors, and I appreciate some people won't um, agree with me on that. But for me, I think he's he's a standout candidate, and, and he's probably the only guy who's going to be able to work with Daniel Levy. Um, and he'll also, I think, at the very least... Um, relate to the fans and have the majority of fans relate to him and get some buy-in immediately. Mm. You get a Deserby yeah. or a Postacoglu or whoever else, it really is going back to the bare bones and starting all over again. Whereas at least with mm. Pochettino, you hope because of the familiarity, he can maybe hit the ground running a little bit. Mm. Yeah, that, that- Listen, I'm, I'm a potch man as well. I mean, my heart is crying out for him to come back, and the emotion part of me is just all over that. Um, my worries, if, I, if, if my head starts to get involved and I start to worry about a few things, I worry how he works with uh, Paratici, with the director of football, and to your point there, Faz, I don't think he will work closely with Levy, if we can, if, which we will continue with the director of football role. He... I wonder how that power balance works between mm. Paratici and and, uh, and, and Poch. Um, he'll play the football that we want. I, th- I actually think we've got players there that can play under Poch. I don't think we're. I don't think the squad's that far away with the players that we've got from a squad that Poch could get hold of and play the Poch way. Mm. Because I mm. think you've got players there that are young. They've got a lot of energy. Um, that they, they can press. You don't have to play those players in 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 in, uh, in a uh, in a in a sort of that low block type mentality, that low block type formation. I think that there's players there that are good enough to play to play in, in in other formations. Whatever happens, though, I think that when we when we went for Conte just before that, I think Levy came out and he said we want to the next manager we we get hold of is going to play the Tottenham way. It's mm. we you know we are Tottenham. This is the way we play. We open, expansive, you know, exciting football, which is all well and good. But I'm okay with whatever manager comes in as long as that is what flows through the whole mm. club, mm. and that the actions that they take back up the words that they're saying in in public. Now, whether that's a mm. Poster Coglu, whether it's a Deserby, whether it's a Poch. Levy's got to start living that philosophy because I think he says it but doesn't believe it. I think he yeah. says it but wants wins now. And that's where the conflict comes in. And if you're in any organisation and there's a conflict between what you're saying your vision is and your actions taken towards that vision are not aligned, they fall apart. And everybody within that organisation then becomes confused about, so what are we doing? How does this work? How do we get to where we need to get to? So there's, there's, that, there's that bit for me. I'd love to see Poch back. He gave. Yeah. He's given me, well, my best times. I think were mid eighties under the general, um, you know. But then uh, Poch has given me the best football that I've seen at Tottenham since since back then, since the early eighties. Mm. Um, mm. So I'd have him back Sorry. in a heartbeat. 
Um, I love the fella. I love his passion. I love the fact that he loves us. The challenge is that, you know, Poch is the girlfriend that gave you the best ever sex. And it got boring towards the end. And we forget about the boring sex because we remember really, really good stuff. Yeah, but I we... wonder if he could reignite that bedroom. Yeah, we don't want to focus back, on the boring know. sex, do you? Yeah, but the, the new girlfriend <laughs> wants to tie us up and beat the shit out of us. <laughs> you, you got a point. We let go of all the great say. sex. Now, <laughs> now we're in a dominatrix relationship. Sorry, you have to sing the fuck out of me. Out of you. Yeah. I've, I don't like it anymore. <laughs> it's worn me down. I've said my safe word a number of times this season. Yeah. He hasn't listened. And not just that, we've been through three of them. He won't let me out. Yeah, you've gone through three of them as well. They're just all turgid, horrible, tie you yeah. up. Pouring yeah. can, hot candle wax over you. It was great for the first <laughs> laugh, six and months. Just laughing and you're just at sick you. of it. Yeah, yeah just it's just not fun at anymore. Us. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not fun just anymore. It's not fun anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Calling you out in front of your family all the time as well. You know, yeah. Telling Posting your revenge that you're just porn online and all being. sorts of shit. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, <laughs> on that so, bombshell. <laughs> well, last topic would be Saturday. Is there a part of you which, and this is horrible to say, because there's only, okay, there actually was a time in recent history that I actually kind of felt happy when I left the, left the stadium after we lost a game. And that was 3-0 to Man United, knowing that finally it was just a matter of time until we saw the club corner flag appear in a tweet and he was hmm. gone. I've got, I just feel like we could actually get fourth if he went tomorrow. But if we beat, if we win on Saturday, he's got two more easy fixtures. He might just limp through this period. And yeah. I, I've just got a little bit, I don't know where your guys' heads are out with this, but uh, I've just, I don't know how to feel about this weekend. And I think a lot of fans don't based on how many tickets are available. I, I offered my ticket for free on Twitter. So you can have it for free. I offered it in WhatsApp. No one wants it. Really? <laughs> no one wants yeah. it. Um, uh, it's a great seat in the South Stand worth 70 quid and no one wants it. So yeah. that just sums it up. But there's just hundreds your guys? <laughs> on, there's hundreds on the exchange yeah. at the moment. It's nuts. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've got tickets Where for you? Saturday as well. I'm in the South Stand too, uh, where my season ticket is. But yeah. I'm actually debating whether to make the journey down at the moment. Uh, it's just got to that point and it's sad. I shouldn't feel like that. I love mm. going to... to to Tottenham and meeting up with mates and going to the football, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I am actually having a doubt right now. It's kind of weird. Mm. It's very rare that that happens. Like you, I'm mm. a season ticket holder, and I very, very rarely miss a game. This is actually because it's my wife's birthday, and I, a bit of an excuse, but yeah, just I'm just not motivated to be. I I kind of feel that if I go, I'm there to make a point of how unhappy I am, and all I'll be doing is using the opportunity to voice my frustration at the manager. Hmm. But what about you, Si and Johnny? If I sack him tomorrow, then I'll go, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if anyone from the club's listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. That, yeah. If you want Faz there, if you want get, me get, there. On, get on board here, boys. Come on. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I can't. We, I think if we were sat 8th or ninth, I'd say, yeah, like, with no chance of going down, no chance of anything else. I'd say just lose as many games and get rid of them as quickly as possible. But we're still fourth. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? We're still fourth, by the way. Mm. Imagine having this conversation 10 years ago where we were like, where we were sort of lulling around like eighth, ninth, maybe we'd push on for for fourth. And when we when we got our first Champions League, you know, when, when Kraut scored that header against Man City and it was like, oh my God, we're there. We finally made to the, to the promised land. We're fourth. We've still got a chance of finishing fourth. And I know that the, the, we, we get into these debates, Cups, Champions League, Cups, Champions Leagues. I want to win a cup. I want to win silverware more than anything else in the world. But the Champions League qualification is what our business model is based on. And if we don't get there, nothing else works. That's the foundation of our business model. So we have to make it happen. So for me, mm. no, I've, we've got a win on. It's a must win on Saturday mm. for me, if anything. 
All right, mm. I'll go then. Thanks, Sai. <laughs> yeah. I'll pay your petrol, Sai. Yeah, I'll pay your yeah, petrol. Cheers, mate. <laughs> That's a fair shout. Support the, make, just make it clear you're supporting the players, but it's a little it. finger up to Conte. I think oh, that's well, he Conte. can fuck off, mate. I'm yeah. No, yeah, totally exactly. gone with that fella. He can do one straight away. He's... But we've we've got to still fight for that fourth whilst it's there. Yeah, yeah. Are Are you, you, fo- listen, if you're a supporter, I don't know. If you're a supporter, you, you can't not want your team to win. If, yeah. you, if you walk out of the stadium at the end of the game, if you've lost. But then we think, okay, well, at least Conte's hopefully going to get sacked tomorrow. Like, like that's the silver lining to that eventuality. We probably won't. Like, we we would probably bag three points with us, a sort of scrape a, a one goal victory. Whereas if we can score a goal, though, we kind of seem to be struggling to score goals the last few games. But um, no, I, I just like I, I think you're right, Jim, about the fixtures that are coming up. But um, yeah. He gets three points, then he gets another three points. But it's like he's not going to get his top three. He's a top four. He's definitely going to get his top three, but he's not going to get his top four. Um, so, yeah, it's it's just it's like every time I, I, I we talk about these, I, I just don't know what to say in the next sentence because like we're just going round and round in circles, aren't mm. we? It's like you know we yeah you want to win, but. It's just de- delaying the inevitable. It's just delaying the inevitable. Mm-hmm. Sai is right about the fact that the journey we've come from and, you know, the our expectations have shifted. Well, that's that's because you do want to grow and you do want to keep improving. And it's getting more difficult with all the, the number of other teams who are capable of spending big and, and that we can't match and all of that. But, like, what I don't understand, and maybe you, you can educate me on this, but... Um, Arsenal haven't been in the, in the Champions League for about like six, seven years, and they've still been able to recruit recruit good players. And okay, there's been a hell of a turnaround in like a swing between Tottenham and Arsenal in the last ten months. Like it's less than ten months since we did that three nil um, to win to, to put the pressure on them to to win the top four. And and um, now look where they are and look where we are. Like I. I that, I don't. I genuinely don't understand that, and and I know sort of, there's been players in the past who haven't come to us when we've been outside the top four um, mm. in the last few years. There's that defender who was up from Seville. I can't remember his name. You know, they won't they won't entertain Tottenham because we're not yeah. in the top four. But like, I think they've been able. To I, saw, I think they've been able to sell a, a philosophy, yeah. a story, a journey, a project, and when you've got someone like Edu who's He's really well respected amongst professionals and they're aligned with Arteta and the board is aligned and they're all saying the same thing. As much as I hate to say it, they've got their ducks in a row down there and they've got a story and they're doing what we did with Poch the first time but around. They have gone back. It's funny. I think we've swapped places with them. You remember when they were under Wenger and just fourth place over and over and over again, they yeah. sacked him and they were going in with these kind of like, proven managers to try and make a point. And mm. they were signing the players we're signing. They were like 40, 50 million quid rejects that weren't quite yeah. good enough for Man City. But they were fishing in that pond. And back in those times, we were the ones picking up Carl Walkers, Christian Eriksen's, yeah. Danny Rose, Luka Modric, Gareth Bale, all these world-class youngsters no one had ever heard of or thought yeah. were going to be very good, mm. coached them to a really high standard and mm. spoiled the party without any pressure on us. They've gone back to that model. Let's buy these young players, Martinelli, Odegaard, all that stuff. And they're flying as a result. And I think we need to go back mm. to that model. And on the finance side of fourth, <laughs> I know it sounds poor, but it's worth about 50 million quid a season, roughly, people say. If you take away 50 million, we have the same revenue as Arsenal do now. Mm. Mm. So, like, I think the way that one benefit of the way the club is now run is we aren't dependent on that Champions League revenue to the extent we were before. The, I think we could. We'd probably find we still find we wouldn't be able to attract quite the caliber of player. But should we just be fishing in that pond we used to fish in, where yeah. where we were really successful at finding these young players? Well, when we land the British Grand Prix, Prix. <laughs> it'll be like when yeah. we got that. <laughs> oh, ultimately, ultimately it depends on the coach, right? You need a coach who's going to coach players up. Right, yep. it was it was Pochettino. Everybody's 100%. saying, "Oh, Pochettino had Alderweire, he had Delhi, he had Derrickson, he had this uh, Dimbelli, whatever." Co- um, Pochettino coached most of these players up. Yeah. Mm. All right. So if you have a coach 
that can coach players up. I mean, yeah. think about what Pochettino or someone like Pochettino might do with a uh, Pedro Porro or even yeah. a Jed mm-hmm. Spence or a Brian yeah, yeah. Hill or, you know, these guys, Pape Sarr, you know, yeah, African yeah, yeah. young Pursuma. player of the year, whatever, right? Pursuma. All these are just, they're just fodder for people like um, uh, Conte. He only plays yeah. skip yeah, right yeah. now because he has to, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, get a coach in that can build a player up who can uh, generate some kind of tactical formation to see his tools succeed, Mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you've got a journey, you've got a story, you've got something to show and to build on. But we we haven't had that since Pochettino left, really. Mm -hmm. I think what he did with Danny Rose. I mean, like, Danny Rose... People wanted him gone. People wanted yeah, Danny Rose yeah. gone. They were spewing yeah. on social media why Spurs gave yeah. Danny Rose a five-year contract. Yeah. And then and now they've just been harping back to, well, we haven't had a decent left back since Danny Rose left. Mm. Mm. Alas, <sighs> yeah, I think we're all on the same page there, but we, we need to end it there. But I want to just finish off again by saying thanks to Vass and anyone yeah, cheers, who doesn't mate. listen to Dr. Tottenham, it's, a, it's an awesome podcast. Um, they're all uh, all really nice, diverse panel as well. Um, yeah. yeah, I'd really, really recommend it. And thanks really a lot, to it regularly. So thanks a lot for coming on. Last My year. pleasure. Thanks for having sure, me. Yeah. Thanks for the shout out. It's been a pleasure being with you boys. Um, yeah, nice one, mate. Onwards and upwards, fellas. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Up the Spurs. Go on, you Spurs. Go on, you Spurs. <laughs> <laughs>